uh, welcome everyone. My name is Kazu Haga and I am a core member of the East Point Peace Academy located here in Oakland and welcome to the first of um, a series of speaker events that we are having uh, that we're calling what, uh, where do we go from here, uh, which, is call which calls us back to the question that Dr. King asked in his third book that he wrote after the Montgomery, oh, I'm sorry, after the Birmingham campaign. Um, which was a really pivotal moment and a real transition moment in the history of the civil rights movement and kind of assessing where the country was at at the time and asking ourselves, where do we as a people, as a movement go from here? And I think this time of COVID is another opportunity for really uh, to us to grapple with that question of as, as a people, as a society, as movements, where we go from here. Um, and we have the honor of hearing from George Lakey today, uh, and at some point in the call, we'll make some uh, announcements about other speakers that we have coming up that we're really excited about. Um, but I also just want to turn the mic very quickly to Astrid, who's also going to be helping us out with this call. So Astrid, if you want to say hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Astrid, and I'm the tech person for this call. So if you have any problem, feel free to message me directly, and I'm a core member of the East Point Peace Academy. And so with that, I think I want to spend a couple of minutes, the privilege and the honor of uh, introducing George Lakey, who many of us may be familiar with him, many of us may be familiar with his work. Um, I found that even people who are not familiar with him and his work, it's very, very possible that you've already been deeply influenced by his work without even knowing it. Um, as someone who's been involved in the world of nonviolence trainings, whether as a participant or as a trainer for the last 20 years, it was not until much later that I realized how much of the work that I do and even some of the activities that I facilitated were either designed by George or George had some direct influence in it. He's really a legend and kind of one of the, the godfather figures of the legacy of nonviolence trainings in this country. Uh, George has been an active activist and organizer and leader and trainer for over six decades, much longer than many of us on the call has been alive. Uh, I found out recently that his first arrest was during the civil rights movement in 1963 in the Sinan movements, and his most recent arrest was relatively recently um, during the uh, for a climate change movement. So his experience spans all the way from civil rights into current movements of today. He's also the author of uh, 10 books, the most recent one, which is How We Win, A Guide to Nonviolent Direct Action Campaigning, as well as a book called Viking Economics, How the Scandinavians Got It Right and How We Can Too. And yeah, if we have time, I'd be really, uh, thank you, Gilda, for showing us that book, How We Win. Um, I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts about how the United States has been, the, how the United States government has been responding with economic policies compared to how the Scandinavian countries have been responding to this coronavirus too. Um, but really, really honored to have you uh, and excited to learn from you one more time. And so with that, I'll hand the mic over to George. Yep, we can see you and hear you. But you can see me. Okay, that's great. That's what's important. I can always run to the mirror if I worry that much about my identity. But actually today, thanks to that very generous introduction, I'm not worried about my identity. <laughs> and I'm delighted to, to have this chance to talk about vision because it is such a, an extremely important thing right now uh, it, because of the coronavirus and for another reason as well. First, I'll point out the coronavirus. Uh, lockdown situation that so many of us are feeling stifled by, a lot of us are even, even suffering by. And I'm just reminded that uh, when when I look at the body, politi body, poli body politic across the country and notice uh, beginnings of demonstrations in which people say, we want to be free, we want to be free, uh, that question that some of the governors are now responding to by saying, well, we will reopen. In fact, we're developing plans for reopening. It might look something like this because it's easier to handle a hard time if we can see the prospect of something better. That is one of the primary uh, things about vision that, that supports our beings. 
we can put up with, in fact, enormous suffering if we know that there's going to something, be something coming out of it that's actually positive. It really helps our spirits. Um, it's very human, very naturally human. Surely some of you have been in the front seat of a car when there have been some small people in the back seat of the car saying, are we there yet? <laughs> because they're tired of being locked down and they want to be reassured that we are going to get to some place better. Well, this is an enormous shakeup to our society, obviously. The media are full of it. We have our own personal experiences of it. But there have been other shakeups in, uh, in our country and other countries, which when I look at the history of it, I notice that very often a shakeup can be followed by very substantial change. Sometimes the change is for the worse, but very often the change is for the better when people especially uh, have a vision of what they'd rather have come out of it. I think, for example, in our country, the United States, about the Great Depression in the 1930s, which I was too young to remember personally, but got plenty of stories from my parents. It was a very, very hard time. It shook things up enormously. And out of that came uh, the greatest progress that the United States made in the first half of the 20th century. It took that, that shakeup, which in the previous decade, the 1920s, was impossible to get the things that progressives really wanted. But in the 30s, it was possible to start to get some of those because the shakeup enabled that to happen. Uh, in the UK, when I think about Britain, because I've worked there quite a lot, I think of the impact of World War II, which was a tremendous shakeup for them. It's no small thing to have your country bombed, and especially your capital city bombed over and over and over and over again. Enormous shakeup. And they got out of World War II even more progress after the war than, than we did, partly because they were more severely shaken up. That's, and also, I think, I would argue this, that they were also more prepared because they had done some more vision work ahead of time. In the 30s for the, for the, uh, the Brits and it continually then in the 40s during the war, people kept doing vision work. How will it be afterward? Let's plan how it will be afterward. That's when they did get single payer health care. We didn't. We almost did, but we didn't get it at that time, partly because we weren't shaken up as much as they were. The present, though, corona shakeup has, has been preceded in our country and also in the Britain, but we'll talk now about our country, uh, by the growing polarization, which uh, is, is very shaking to especially people on either end, but also to the people in the middle. The people on the left, uh, my friends, very shaken up by the growth of neo-Nazis, the resurgence of racism in very ugly forms, the, uh, the killings of people in synagogues and so on. And then on the, on the right, though, people are just as shaken up by the Me Too movement, by the movement for Black Lives and the other uh, insurgencies that are happening. The young people in Florida, insisting on gun control, things that horrify the people on the right. It's very shaking to see a country politically polarized. Important for you to know, though, that political scientists, you may already know this, that political scientists have discovered a very strong correlation between political polarization and economic inequality. The more economic inequality, the more political polarization, which means that even though we've experienced so much already, we can uh, expect there will be even more polarization in the coming years because it's been locked in, for one thing, by the, uh, the tax bill that was passed a year and a half ago, but also uh, the, it looks to me like we will discover in the in the hustle and bustle in the federal government about responding to this coronavirus, that there will be even more economic inequality as a result 
both of federal policy and it's also as a result of the tremendous uh, mass unemployment that's going on. Even the New York Times is concerned about this. The editorial board is outraged that we've allowed mass unemployment to happen when the Danes, uh, just across the Atlantic Ocean from us, pursue a much smarter policy of keeping everybody employed while they go through their, uh, their coronavirus-induced recession slash, uh, we'll see if it turns into a depression, but it may. Uh, but the Danes did the right thing, the US did the wrong thing, and the New York Times even is polarized, is upset about this, and they're not part of the polarization process as such. So what we've got is a very, very interesting situation with regard to, to vision. Now, I, if this were 10 years ago, would be in despair. Looking at all this opportunity when things are so shaken up for vision, 10 years ago, we were fairly visionless. And I would have been in despair if we were still in that situation. So I'm happy to report that something some of you already know, which is that in 2016, the movement for Black Lives broke the spell of Americans and actually came forward with a vision. They also call it a platform. You can easily Google it and read it. I recommend it. Terrific vision. And uh, that broke the ice. That was also the year that my book, Viking Economics, came out, which is also a highly visionary book. And the attention it got in the first week, I couldn't believe it. I've always been a movement person writing for movement people. Don't expect the establishment to pay attention, the ma mainstream media. But in the first week of my book's appearance, there were articles about it in uh, the Atlantic Monthly and Bloomberg.com on the day of publication wrote about it and Time Magazine wrote about it. So indications, I think, that there was a, a, an ice breaking going on in 2016, which has been followed by other uh, visionary attempts. And everywhere I look, there's more and more people open to vision who 10 years ago were vision averse, maybe because they were somewhat despairing about the possibility of anything better coming out of this mess. Well, uh, there, there is a growth of, of interest in vision. Another reference I can make to this is the Vermont Vision Summit. I don't know how how fully uh, this has crossed the uh, country and people's awareness, but hundreds of people from all parts of Vermont engaged in a two-year process to work on a vision of what should Vermont look like. And now there are additionally uh, 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 people working on the Vermont uh, state legislature level to incorporate the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is itself a vision. It's not as complete a vision as some visions are, but it's nevertheless uh, a, a very a, a surprisingly extended kind of vision of how much change could be made in the United States. Black, uh, as compared with Medicare for All, again, way more in the visionary line than 10 years ago, uh, but still much more restricted to the healthcare system itself, rather than the Green New Deal being very expansive and including multiple, uh, uh, multiple aspects of equality and uh, economic uh, gains and even uh, an anti-racist component. So th these are the things that are exciting me these days. Um, I just, uh, just emailed a couple of hours ago a proposal to my own mailing list of ways in which people could form teams and create visions uh, on their own at a grassroots level. And within the first hour of my sending that back, I got dozens of responses saying, count me in, I want to do this, I want to do this, even though it's under, it would be undertaking a three to six month process, I want to, I want to sign up for this. So this is a very, very exciting time for us to be looking at this. The next step will be, uh, given how excited I am, uh, well, how excited are you? This, this next exercise, which you'll do in breakout rooms, uh, will be explained by Kazu. Or maybe I'll explain it. We'll find out. Still learning um, the Go ahead, if, 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 if you wanna explain that, that would be great. It? Yeah. No, okay. Happy to. Yeah, so what I'm suggesting is that when you go into breakout rooms, that each of you 
take a time to share. First, I want you all to have a minute to, to think about this question. So just track your insights with regard to this question. So I have a couple of minutes of quiet in the beginning of the breakout group. And then one at a time, I'd like to invite each of you to share with the others for three minutes. And the, what you'll get to share in that three minutes is a time in my life when I was successful in getting what I wanted after making that goal clear and vivid in my mind. That is, I got very clear time in my life, maybe this is multiple times, and if so, just choose one, a time in my life when I got very clear about something that I wanted, and then I was actually successful in getting, in getting that. It's okay if no such time occurs to you. You can still use your three minutes to think out loud about your relationship to goals and to vision and what it is that attracts you to it and what it is that gets in your way of fully uh, sketching it out or more fully developing it as, as a clear goal to go for. But if you remember a time in your life when you did have a clear goal and went for it and succeeded, uh, that's, that's also very worth sharing with, with these folks in the breakout room. Please do that. Thank you. So just so everyone knows the flow for what will happen next is we'll have an opportunity to hear from a few of you about uh, anything that came up that you want to share about in your small groups. Um, and then I'll be making a couple of announcements and then we're going to jump into, uh, I think the, the big part of our call is just going to be an open Q&A with George. Um, so feel free to start thinking of questions that you may have for him or things that you'd like to, to hear him reflect on. Um, and then about quarter past seven, we'll be getting back into uh, this time into pairs, um, just for each person to have a chance to reflect with it. one, maybe two, two people, depending on how the numbers work, um, just about uh, anything that emerged from this call. And then we'll be hearing some closing words from George and we'll wrap up around 7.30 East Coast time, uh, which is, uh, I should know this because I'm on the West Coast. I suppose that'll be 4.30. Um, so if we can get a few people to share uh, anything that you want to reflect on coming out of those small groups, anything that uh, you talked about in the small groups that uh, you want to share, you can do so by either putting it uh, into the chat that you want to share and we can call on you, or you can do so by raising your hand um, and to do that. Okay. So yeah, Christina. Well, just briefly, I mean, the goal I remembered was very much a personal goal, but what I wanted to share was that I was in a goals group and we very much supported each other. And I feel like that was a, a big part of being able to reach the goal and to have the hope and belief and the brainstorming and the resources from other people that helped me get there. And that's the main thing I want to share is I believe I was able to get to that, reach that goal, uh, which seemed kind of unbelievable because I had had support of others. Yeah. And doing um, accompaniment work in Central America with Peace for Grades International and other groups. And then in 93, uh, as we had wars, conflicts all over the world, it seemed to me we needed to have peace teams on a much larger scale rather than just uh, protecting individual people. Um, so I, I decided to write out my vision of what uh, peace teams on a larger scale might look like. And uh, that got sent around to a bunch of folks and Elise Boulding sent that out to hundreds of her people around the world and uh, the next six years, uh, I was interacting with people that kind of shared that vision. And by 99, six years later, uh, at the Hague Appeal for Peace, found people that said, let's work together to really make this happen. And that was the beginning of the Nonviolent Peace Force. So that was just very empowering to me. Hi, welcome everybody and good to be here. Um, you know what came up for me was not necessarily a specific goal, 
but when I have met goals, what was in common? Like, what did they share in common? And for me, it was about when I realized that I had clarity of purpose and there was a certain, I wouldn't say the word certainty, but certainly like I didn't, I didn't feel a lot of resistance. I didn't feel a lot of doubt that, uh, and I felt very aligned to where I was going. Even when I didn't know what I was doing, the things would appear that I needed. So there's a lot of synchronicity, a lot of serendipitous connections. Um, kind of similar to what David was just talking about, that all of a sudden people that you didn't even know existed would show up and those things would kind of come together. And so that's always something I remember about like being mindful of the clarity of your purpose and the power of that. All right, thank you. This one's a little bit more personal, but it came to mind when the question was raised was uh, working on my master's thesis. I'd been in a grueling graduate program and then just reached a moment where the thesis just need to be written. And it was that feeling tone, that intestinal fortitude moment of like, this has to happen. It's going get to it, get done and I'm going to be the person to do it. So that's what came to mind. There. Uh, many of you may know that the East Point Peace Academy uh, operates on a set of principles called the gift economy. Um, and that means that we've never charged a single dime for any of the events that we've uh, sponsored over the last six or seven years. We've had thousands and thousands of people come through our door um, and we've never charged anybody anything. And the gift economy for us uh, relies on these seven principles, which we don't have time to go over all of them today, but we do want to share a little bit on the sixth principle, which is transparency. Um, many of you know that we have our budget as well as our quarterly uh, financial updates posted on our website. Uh, in 2019, we spent a total of just under $120,000, um, 96,000 of which was raised directly from our community. So we're mostly an organization that's not funded by institutions and foundations. And so we really rely on the generosity of our community to sustain our work. Um, and our work is, as you know, a lot of the work that we do is in prison. We have teams of nonviolence trainers uh, spread out throughout various prisons and institutions throughout uh, California. But we also do trainings in everything from uh, philosophical forms of nonviolence to movement building work to this new training that we've launched called Fierce Vulnerability. Um, and we really rely heavily on our workshops, even though we don't charge money for people uh, to come into our workshop spaces. We do ask for donations to sustain our work. And obviously, during COVID, we've had to cancel all of our workshops. Um, and so we're trying to adjust and see how we can continue to offer programs on a gift basis. One of my favorite quotes is this quote says, when giving is done out of pure joy, you can't tell who the giver is and who the recipient is. And so I'd like to invite everyone on this call to really think about whether it would make you happy to, sus to help sustain our work financially in these times. We know that a lot of people are hurting economically, so this is purely an invitational thing. But if you feel like it would make you happy to know that you're helping to sustain our work, we invite everyone to go to eastpointpeace.org and click on the donate button and uh, help sustain our work. And I believe Astrid is going to be uh, putting um, a link to that in our chat box as well. So thank you all for allowing me those few minutes. And uh, we're going to transition now uh, into our Q&A. So, George, you have a, a, I do have goals, but lately, especially, I focus on being my best self more than grasping for goals. I think of my farm bosses who would say they focus on the soil and environment more than the plants themselves. Oh, interesting. Uh, for me, myself and spirit are all are the soil and the goals are the plants to a certain degree. So, George, I don't know if you want to reflect on that a little bit or if you'd like me to keep going uh, if that's what works for you good 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 um, I, I realized I was jotting down the comments of the uh, four who spoke out of the small groups out of the breakout groups and I realized that there are additional um, incentives that that they were reporting on that might be useful uh, to our friend who just shared and maybe not um, but I noticed the the first person who shared was talking about how uh, it enabled 
more others to give more support to her, knowing what her goal was. And there are times when you can just manifest what you need within yourself, but how great to get support from others, right? And then the second person who shared was talking about, uh, that was David, I think, talking about scaling up a, a personal experience that he had to be a vision that ended up being a global vision. And uh, that having a, being able to, um, to, to have a vision enables you to scale up something that's wonderful for you. And that's, that's, that's pretty great that uh, David shared. And then Sandra was, uh, I heard her talking about that clarifying dimension of, of uh, visioning, um, putting her in more alignment with the vision. Because uh, I, what I took from that is that I know that sometimes I'm ambivalent. I've got ambivalent, I've got resistance within myself to really going for it all the way, being all in. And the more we clarify the vision of what it is we want, the more that resistance inside ourselves that we may be mostly unconscious of can, can fade away. And then finally, I think it was maybe Boyle who said that there was um, an increase in her determination that, that came about as a result of clarifying that goal or that vision. And I, all those are real pluses that have to do with the expression of personal power. So um, if I could just add, I was very personal because I love us, be, uh, our persons being political. <laughs> and at the same time, uh, there are some political uh, strategic advantages to having a vision that might be good for us to remember when we're movement building. Uh, I realized that in my introduction, I wasn't really talking about what vision does for us as a movement. And one thing that it does, expressing a vision clearly, is it really enables us to get more people on our side. That was very striking in my research on the Nordic countries, that each of the movements in the Nordic countries started out as a small minority that a lot of people shrugged their shoulders about. Well, you're never going to take over because it's always been the economic elite that runs our country for hundreds of years. What makes you think you can change that? But because they went through a, an envisioning process, they were able to describe what life could be. You know, a Norwegian could say to a next door neighbor, uh, but wouldn't you like it if your society enabled your youngsters to go to college without having to pay money for it? I mean, why, should, why shouldn't college be free? Why shouldn't university be free in order to fully, fully uh, empower ourselves as individuals and also fully empower the economy of the country? And wouldn't that make sense? Wouldn't you like that? And so often those movements were able to grow because they were able to express in common sense terms what the result would be of, of their vision. So winning, winning people over is a big, big thing. And then the other thing that uh, the strategic use of it is as a source of unity for multiple movements. And that is way more a, a matter of concern for us here in this country than it is in some countries that are more homogeneous. Um, the big split in the Nordic countries was the farmers versus the industrial workers. So they had to create a vision that would enable both the farmers and the industrial workers to realize they would have a better life. If they threw the economic elite out, which is what they did, they pushed them out of power so that they could create the kind of society that would benefit both the farmers and the industrial workers. Well, that problem that they were facing was small scale compared with ours, right? Because there are so many movements in our country and of, of different identities, among other things, identities that say, hey, my identity needs to not be in the shadows and it needs to be out here in the open and so on. Though each of those identity groups is is in a highly competitive overall culture, very tempted to say, me, 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 what about us? But also the issue groups, gun control is more important than climate. No, climate control is more important than gun control. And so 
by creating a vision of a whole society that would meet the variety of issues and would put on an equal, uh, an equal platform, an equal ground, the various identity groups, we have a way, way better chance of succeeding in our goal and enhancing everybody's life. So, and in fact, without, without a vision to unite us, I frankly don't see the chance of getting the unity that we need because there is so much competitiveness. When the, the Women's March occurred, four million Americans, right? That's an amazing scale for our country, four million people hitting the streets the day after the inauguration of Donald Trump. Um, and I thought, oh, yes, now we have a women's committee. It looks as though it's going to stay in being so that there can be one next year. Oh, well, in a competitive society, that's just crying for an alternative, you know, a rival women's committee. <laughs> Because that is this uh, very uh, disabling uh, context that we live in. Everybody wants, well, if you have one thing, then you have to have another thing. And so, the, again, the, the emphasis on unity uh, is, is that we, without it, we can't win. And with, with it, we can win. And a vision is a way of getting that unity. In the U.S., we focus way too much in our society in in my view on either the next quarterly earnings report uh, or we focus on the next election or as soon as we get done with an election we're then starting to focus on who's the next go nominee going to be what's the next thing and we never get to a vision of and and you mentioned the the work in vermont well, in Vermont, that that might work, um, but for our for the United States of America as a as a country, and then we got all the faults of you know all countries and nationalism and all of that. But is there a vision, and and how can our country, or how can how can people have a vision that we see for society, however that's defined? And you mentioned in the book, you know national you know college you know fully paid or, or very inexpensive college and trade schools and so on uh, obviously health care and and parental leave and all of these kinds of benefits that people in the nordic countries enjoy and now take and enjoy how do we get to that point and I, I'm not very optimistic to, I'm sorry to say, about, about getting there. And I, I see David Hartzell laughing. <laughs> so. Well, you see, I think we make it impossible to get there if we don't have a vision. Because um, I, I, I think of myself walking down the street. If I were walking down the street, I don't know about you, but if a car, let's say a, a van drove up and stopped beside me, had a bunch of people in it, rolled down the windows and said, hey, you want to jump in? We're fun. Come on in. I would almost certainly say, and where are you going? And if they shrugged their shoulders, we don't know where we're going. Wouldn't you like to join us? Uh, I don't think I would do that. In fact, I haven't met anybody who would do that. Uh, we do want to know where the van is going. And it's very hard for us to get movements of the size necessary to win if we don't tell people where we're going. It's such a natural question. People want to know where we're going. Why should I join your movement? If you don't know, if you haven't put the time in the study to know what it is you would do if you had power, well, why should I help get you power if you don't know what you're doing. So that, it seems to me, is very basic. If we do that, then I think we will attract tons of people because there are so many people unhappy. The, the, uh, all the polls indicate the legitimacy of the United States system is going down, 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 decade by decade. By 2016, 40% of the uh, uh, eligible voters didn't even bother to vote. It's, it's, 
people want to know what's different. In 2018, there were congressional candidates that got more people out to vote for them because they said, if I'm elected, I would do this and this and this and this and this, because they were, they were being forthright. That's what we need. We need a platform. Thank you. Um, I'm also seeing the kind of million dollar question from Lisa, who's asking, how do we get a vision that can unite people in this divided country? And can you give us some examples? So how do we do it? And what would a vision like that even look like? Great question. I think it would take uh, a while to do it. I think it would take a lot of debate. Uh, what I like about Medicare for all is noticing it's not a whole vision. It's only a vision about, of, for a different healthcare system. On the other hand, the healthcare system takes more and more of our money, more and more of our attention. So it's getting bigger and bigger, but still it's not the vision of the whole thing. It's a vision of the healthcare system. But did you notice in 2016 when Bernie Sanders was putting it forward, it was so marginalized. And in 2020, in uh, the, uh, nearly every presidential candidate in the Democratic side had to take a position on it. It had grown so much in force. Uh, so in four years, that's, that's really in a country whose recent political history has been to vis be vision averse, to be able to take seriously such a dramatic change in healthcare delivery uh, is, is extraordinary. The Green New Deal, which is way more expansive a vision than uh, Medicare for All, again, got so much more play. The initial polling that was done showed not only a majority of Democrats liked the way that sounded, a majority of Republicans thought that sounded like a good idea. <laughs> These are people, our people are more and more up for vision, but they're, they're, but it's still somewhat skimpy pickings. They're, they're being called by so many movement activists to come out and oppose this and oppose that and oppose the other thing instead of saying, come on out and make this happen. And if we have enough people, we can make it happen. That's when you really incentivize people to do the sweating, the hard work to get something done. But it won't be quick. Now, there's a huge advantage over the 1930s. The 1930s was the biggest period in the 20th century when we really, uh, we were set up for it by the huge polarization, the huge economic uh, uh, inequality that existed at that time. So that those were large conditions that enabled us to do very serious politics. And it was the last time when visioning was really on the table. The problem then was we had two alternative visions put forward by people who, who conflicted with each other constantly. It was the democratic socialist vision and it was the communist vision. And they were at odds. The communist party and the socialist party were fighting all the time. So the American people, although they were sick and tired of capitalism at that time and very open to change, very open to change, were not being presented with a coherent vision. They were being uh, presented with two that were in competition with each other. The Nordics, although there was communism around, it was very marginal because, uh, because the social democratic vision that they uh, came forward with was put in such common sense terms that when people got sick of the existing capitalist system, which most people actually are most of the time, then they uh, said, well, let's go for that. That makes so much sense. I have had conversations with a Trump voter in which I asked him, well, how, how are things health-wise in your family? And he described the grandchildren he has who are very challenged physically, mentally. His, his daughter, their mom, is a hero because she's constantly working to get services. It's very tough. She's very, very tired all the time because it's so hard to deal with these youngsters. I said, well, you know, I'm recently back from Norway. And how that would be dealt with in Norway is blah, 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 explain it. And I said, and how that would fit into their healthcare system as a whole and their larger picture is blah, 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 blah. And uh, I stop. And he looks at me and he says, sounds like a plan. So there's my Trump voting uh, friend saying, 
He's all signing up for socialized medicine. <laughs> but if I said, hey, what about socialized medicine? Will you think of that? Come on. So what we need is to develop a vision and we can, we, these muscles, vision developing muscles are starting to build now. Very, very much co compared with 2016. Um, we, if we do that, we will be able to describe our vision in common sense terms. Most working class uh, voters who, for Trump will be over with us in a minute because they all have problems that could not be solved in capitalist terms, but can be solved in terms of a common sense vision that's based, uh, that, that doesn't start from capitalist premises. So I'm optimistic, but you can also see I'm, hope, I'm, I'm very much hoping that activists who've been going lately to one-off demonstrations for this or that cause reactively, oh, we don't like this, so we'll go protest that. Oh, we don't like that because we'll go protest that. We'll stop for a minute, ask how much actual change we're getting out of that, and change our approach, maybe change starts here with ourselves. Maybe we need to change to be visionaries who are able to communicate in common sense terms and invite people to jump into the van because they want to go where we're going. Then I think we will grow much more rapidly and then we, uh, we have a chance to win. Thank you. And I think we might have time for one more question. There's a question from Barbara who says, uh, oh, where'd it go? Can you talk about what you see as some of the opportunities as well as challenges now specifically for the climate movement? And people may also be interested in um, uh, astro, uh, astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson's podcast. His most recent episode was on the relationship between climate change and the coronavirus. So yeah, George, if you could speak to that a little bit. Opportunities and challenges for the climate change movement. Well, that's where my mind goes is the coronavirus because that's the disaster that we're now contending with and is 24 seven, what we're thinking about, right? So the opportunity for the climate change uh, movement is to make that connection, is to say, okay, we're in the middle of a disaster that's happening in the United States. What do we think of our systemic response? How are we doing? What are our strengths? And people will be able to relate to strengths of people, whoa, People in the healthcare system working night and day, right? The tremendous, the people doing essential services, the people collecting our trash, the people who are keeping things going often are heroes. So we can be very affirmational about the people. On the other hand, some of the systems <laughs> we can be very critical of and say, well, if this is a dress rehearsal for climate disaster, which is what I would say, it's a dress rehearsal for climate disaster, then we have some overhauling to do in our systems. And so that was the connection I would make. I think in, in that way, the climate crisis, uh, the, the climate concern can, can grow exponentially by using this as an example. Thank you, George. I'm also seeing some more comments in the chat there. Uh, a question around, is there an effort to convene some kind of national people's convention where a coalition can be forced to create and support a platform that can that we can support in some form? Uh, also a comment from Pete saying, I'm not sure we need to define exactly the vision. For me, a focus on reorienting our values towards proper relationship respect for nature and the native understanding of what that means. This pandemic can be understood as nature forcing us to stop and reorient. It is from that reestablishment that an all encompassing vision with specific policies can be understood and led by not our egos, but grow out of this new relationship with the natural world, which we are a part of not in charge of. So yeah, reconnecting with nature and, and being guided by some of that wisdom and that intelligence as opposed to trying to think our way out of the problem is a little bit of what I'm hearing. Um, any final reflections you want to offer before we put people back into small groups? Well, because of my experience in talking with Trump voters in common sense ways about vision, I really urge us to uh, to do grassroots work first before we try to go national on vision. Uh, because I think we need to develop our muscles of communication 
and that the, the, the wisdom of common people needs to be taken into account in the developing of vision. In other words, I wouldn't hand it over to university people, even though I've often made my living as a professor in a university. Uh, I wouldn't hand it over to, you know, the, 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 the technocrats of the world and the, and the, uh, and, and the scientists and so on. I would, I would want it to be very grassroots based. And at the same time, of course, to access the resources, the intellectual resources that exist. And it was that kind of thing that worked for the Nordic countries. They had economists who were very, very smart working along with uh, workers, study groups, and so on, and were able to develop the vision together. That happened in Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and it could happen here. Uh, so that's the kind of process uh, that I see. I wouldn't like to see it leapfrogged. On the other hand, if uh, yeah, yeah. So that's what I would say. Let's 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 turn to our neighbors. Let's form groups. Let's have discussion groups on what it is we would rather have. You're on mute now. Oh, okay. Yeah, one of the scriptural sources says, "Where there is no vision, the people perish," <laughs> mm. which is a pretty, uh, you know, pretty strong push <laughs> in the direction of vision. I hope that we don't go. Uh, into vision because we don't want to perish, but instead that we go into vision because it's actually life-giving. Going back to the beginning of this session when when uh, people were sharing with each other and then sharing out with us, it's actually empowering to us to have a vision and it's empowering to movements to have a vision. And we, my, my experience, I'm 82 years old, I'm still all in with regard to movement stuff. And I think the reason why uh, I haven't, you know, like a lot of people kind of retired because they got whatever. Uh, but I think the reason I'm so excited still to be in the movement is because it is life giving for me. And it does empower me to be, to make the personal political as the feminists say, to, and to regard my personal vision as something that can be expressed through movement work and the movement vision uh, be a kind of feedback loop for me. And so that integrity, that putting the whole thing together, it gives me life. And why would I want to stop doing that? So I, that's what I'm, that's, that's where I come to again and again, when I think, well, shouldn't I go back? You know, what about uh, shuffleboard? George, you're the ace, you ought to love shuffleboard. But <laughs> I'd rather get arrested, which I was with Jane Fonda, who's the same age as I am, a few months ago, because I think the movement can be our life if we, uh, not in the sense that we can't do anything else, but in the sense that it can give us life and we can give it life. Well, George, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. And thank you to everyone who showed up on our call. Again, this is just the, the first of a series of uh, speaker events that we're going to be hosting at East Point. Uh, we hope to see some of you next week for a similar conversation with Erica Chenoweth. Um, and also, if folks go to our website at eastpointpeace.org, uh, we also have other non-speaker uh, type of events that are coming up, including a virtual song circle uh, with a, a song leader from the Bay Area who's going to be helping us to um, sing songs together, which is, has always been a very important part of movements is singing songs together. Um, something that's very uniting and something that can be very healing. So please join us for that as well as other opportunities to stay in community. So yeah, with that, I just want to thank you, George, again for joining us and thank you all. And we will see you all next uh, next time, hopefully next week, some of you all. All right. Folks wanna, oh, here we go. I'm just going to unmute everyone if you want to say goodbye. Uh, thank you. To everyone as you log off. Thank, thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was really great. Thank you, Ami. Be well, all. Thanks for working.